Um, I'm going to read our scripture today. Uh, it's the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation. And we just sang about some of this. Uh, it says, Then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, uh, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw the lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Hello, everybody. Happy Easter to all of you. My name is Ron Watts. I'm one of the pastors here at LaCroix. And for 2,000 years, the church has been gathering on this day, this special day, this glorious day to remember the most important event in human history. And for 30 years, I've had the privilege of bringing an Easter message to you. And one of the things I do every year is join the tradition that has been going on for 2,000 years, and that is where the pastor says, Christ is risen, and the people respond by saying, Christ is risen indeed. And this is a little bit of a different Easter because normally I have a full room of people shouting that back to me. Today, I'm in front of an empty room. But wherever you are in your living rooms or wherever it is that you are found, whether you're by yourself or you're with others, can we do this today? We won't let this crisis keep us from celebrating Easter. And so I'll say Christ is risen and you respond. I hope your neighbors hear you responding, Christ is risen indeed, ready? Christ is risen. Louder. Christ is risen. Amen and amen. Well, now I want to um, remind my baby, baby boomer friends about something. It was a, uh, an event, the television event of the year. It happened every year. In fact, it happened every year from 1959 to 1991. It was a movie. And it was on Sunday night, I think about 6 or 6.30 Central Time, and we looked forward to this movie every year, especially when we were young. Um, it was so popular in the early years that it got like 50% Nielsen ratings, almost unheard of today. It was in the early part of the year. Do you know what movie I'm talking about? I bet you do. The Wizard of Oz. 
Yeah, this classic movie became sort of an event for our country to sit in front of our televisions and to watch this epic story. And so um, uh, it tells the story of Dorothy. Dorothy, who gets swept up in a tornado and taken to a strange land, a wonderful land, a dangerous land called Oz. And here she meets uh, three new friends, the Scarecrow, the Cowardly Lion, the Tin Man. And together they go down the yellow brick road to meet the Wizard of Oz to get the things that they are looking for. And what is Dorothy looking for? She wants to get home. She wants to get back to Kansas where everything is right where Auntie M is, where the farmhands are, and well, where Elmira Gulch is put in her place. Um, but she's lost, and she's in a dangerous land, and she just wants to get home. And I think this, so this story, like all the great stories, like all the great movies, resonates and um, is, is, is something that is enduring because it tells something about the human story. We're all like Dorothy, lost in a dangerous place, and we just want to get home because there's no place like home. And all of the great stories, the beautiful stories, speak of the human condition. Well, today what I want to do is I want to talk about the greatest story of them all, the most epic of all tales, the story of Easter. And what makes it so great and marvelous and grand is that it's a true story. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective. A couple years ago, I read a little book by one of my favorite authors, N.T. Wright, Anglican scholar and bishop, called Following Jesus. And in his book, he has this short chapter on the book of Revelation, the book, this strange, wonderful book at the end of our Bibles. And I put it down and I said, oh my, that was amazing. One day, that'll be an Easter sermon. Two years later, here we are. And when I planned this two years ago, I had no idea how relevant it would be for this cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Because what we see in the book of Revelation is the story of Easter in all of its grandeur, in all of its glory. And it is one of the most epic stories. Easter is the most epic of all stories. And we see that so well and so clearly in the book of Revelation, which takes us up to about a 30,000 foot view and allows us to see the big picture and the big plan. You see, part of the problem is that we've reduced Easter. We've made it smaller than it was ever intended to be. We make it about our present spiritual lives. Jesus died and rose again so that we could be saved from our sins and he could be our friend and, and uh, savior. And that's all true. Every bit of that is true. It's just only part of the story. Sometimes we make Easter about the future that it proves that there is life beyond the grave. Again, that's true, every little bit of it, but it's only a small part of the story. What Revelation helps us see, and maybe one of the reasons we're not only afraid of the, the picture language and all the symbolism, but because of the sheer uh, uh, majesty of the telling of the story is that it makes it so much bigger. What is Easter? It's the beginning of God's new world. It's about making right everything that is wrong in this world. Easter is the most epic of all stories. Now, what I'd like to do in telling this is I, I want to I look at the kind of the big picture of Revelation, the big story, but I want to zoom in on chapter 5. But before that, um, we, we see it open with a, that John, the apostle, He's on the island of Patmos where he has been exiled because of his faith. And he has this vision and he's taken into the very throne room of God. And here he sees Jesus and he has this vision of Jesus. And here it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. 
I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I call, and I, see, there's the Easter story. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. John wants us to know right here at the beginning of this revelation, at the beginning of this vision, that Jesus holds the keys to whatever it is you have lost, to whoever it is you have lost. Jesus holds the keys to life itself. And everything that's locked behind those doors, the shame, the pain, the heartache, the misery, our own failures and our own brokenness, he's able to open those doors and bring new life. Jesus holds the keys. Now we get to fast forward then to chapter five. And we see that no one one else on earth does. John has this vision and and it says he sees the the throne of God and, and in verse two it says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll because God had the scroll in his hands in the first verse. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. What is John saying? He's saying no one on earth is able to open the scroll. What is the scroll? It's the plan of God. It's the, 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 the redemptive plan of God for the salvation of the whole world. We have all, every last one of us, contributed to the brokenness of this world, conti- con- contributed to its being scarred, ruined. But you see, we're not worthy. No one is worthy. But there is one who has the keys, and he alone is worthy. Verse 5, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures. And the elders, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the world. And friends, here's what you have. You have the Easter story told in vivid picture language. The lamb who has, looks like he's been slain, who, be, who is really the lion of the tribe of Judah. The one who has all authority, yet who died and now lives, who has seven horns. Horns represented kingly authority. The fact that Jesus has seven means that he has all authority on heaven and earth. He has seven eyes. Now, some of us suspected that our mothers had eyes in the back of their heads. Now, kids watching, your moms do have eyes in the back of their heads, but Jesus, he has seven eyes, which means he's omniscient. He sees it all. He sees everything. He is the omnipotent, omniscient one. He is worthy. And because he was the lamb who was slain, and because he conquered, they sing a new song. They, it says they sing a new song. Well, if there's a new song, what does that mean? There must necessarily be an old song. And that old song is found at the end of chapter 4, right before what we're looking at. And here in verse 11, they're singing to God, and they say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So the old song, what? is a song of praise to our God, who created the heavens and the earth and declared them to be good. It's a praise, it's a song of praise to the creator. And then we get, what, chapter five? We discover no one is worthy because we have all marred God's good creation, God's good earth. But don't despair. There's a new song, and they sing it to the lamb who was slain, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Because this is a song of redemption. God created the world good. Because of our sin, our rebellion, it was broken. But there is one who has come to redeem all of creation. And so they sing, picture 
Picture the hallelujah chorus with the biggest choir you've ever seen in your life. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and nation. You, made, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So the first stanza of this new song talks about what he has accomplished. He died. He died, and his death was redemptive. Not just for you and me to have our sins forgiven. Yes, yes, that. But so the whole creation, everything that's wrong in this world would be made right. It goes on, and there's a second stanza. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. This verse speaks about what he deserves because he is redeeming all of creation. He deserves all praise, all glory, all honor, all power. And you know, just as we are guilty of... um, reducing the Easter story, we can sometimes be guilty of reducing Jesus to sort of our spiritual lives. You know, Jesus is someone we talk about on Sunday morning, but what about the rest of the week? And through, what, so what do we do? We, we sing our songs to Jesus on Sunday, but through the week we ascribe all power to politicians, all honor to celebrities, and all glory to athletes. But this story, this song, and the verse of this song says that at the end of the day, all power and honor and glory belongs to him because he is redeeming the world. You see, in our, human, in our stories, um, it's shown that even, even the, the heroes in the story have feet of clay. Dorothy and her friends get to, the, get to an audience in front of the wizard, and of course, he's, he's imposing, and there's smoke, and there's, there's loud sounds and booming voices, and, and then little Toto, the dog, gets behind the curtain. <laughs> and remember that? And, and, and the guy said, and, and the Wizard of Oz says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, it turns out that the great, mighty Wizard of Oz is just, oh, a middle-aged guy, normal sort of guy, just like us. All human stories, really, that's the story. But in this story, there is one who is truly a hero, who is truly remarkable, who has no feet of clay, who is worthy of all honor, glory, power, and majesty. Why? Because of his death and his conquering of death. He is redeeming the whole world. So with this 30,000 foot view, let's look at the end of the story. We get to Revelation chapter 21, And this glorious picture, Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now look at this, look at at chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. It says he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Notice he doesn't say, I'm making all new things. He's saying, I'm making all things new. Friends, that's the story of redemption. God takes broken things and makes them new. God takes broken people and makes them new. And if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation, this It's the greatest of all stories. It's the story of redemption. And I want you to notice something 
that's present if you're really, really observant. You'll notice that it was in the scriptures that we read. There's this feature, this thing. In fact, it's in all of the epic stories that are told. This thing is found in the Wizard of Oz. It's found in in all of the great stories. I'll tell you, because you have to be really, really observant to pick it out. But you'll, you'll say, ah, once I tell you. You know what it is? It's the presence of tears. It's the presence of tears. When John notices that nobody is worthy to open the scroll because all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, he weeps. Now, we go back to Easter morning. Mary comes to the tomb wanting to to do the final preparations for Jesus' burial that were cut short on Friday, and, and, and she discovers the stone is rolled away and the body is gone and her immediate assumption is that someone has added insult to injury they've stolen the body and she is weeping the last time we saw peter who you could argue was jesus very best friend the last time we see him before easter is denying that he even knows Jesus for a third time. And when he realizes what has happened after hearing the rooster crow, he runs away, weeping bitter tears. It's in every great story because tears are part of the human story, the human condition. It's part of what makes us human beings. Tears are always part of the story. Um, This past year, we've said goodbye to a lot of longtime members of our church, people who have been with us for, for 25, 30 years, building the church and serving the Lord and loving people. And, and it's been, it's been hard saying goodbye. And there's been some tears. I've shed some tears over the past year. And you know, that's normal. We, we know what it is to lose and to suffer loss. And in this season, Oh my, what loss we have experienced. All across our city, people have lost their jobs. Some of you have lost your jobs. And you're strong in front of your spouse. And you're trying to be strong and brave in front of your kids. But when you get alone quietly in the morning or at night, your eyes pool with tears. And you wonder, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the rent or the mortgage? Some of you are business people and you had a dream and you started a business, maybe it was a restaurant and you put your heart and soul into that and you worked so hard and you got it up and going and in just a matter of the past three weeks you're seeing what could be the very death of that dream. And truth be told, many tears across our own city. I drive through the streets of our city and I see so many businesses that I love and people that I love who own them and I, my eyes fill with tears. In nursing homes across our area and across the whole country, our parents, our grandparents aren't even able to have visitors, and rightly so, we wanna keep them safe, but yet, there are tears. There are people now with the COVID-19 virus who are in ICU, some are on ventilators, and their family members can't even be there to hold their hand and to comfort them in their sorrow. And there's these tears, not only because of the the potential loss, but of separation. And in New York City, the streets are flooded with tears today. 19 years ago, the Big Apple was the center of that attack from terrorists. Terrorists who were going after us had the bullseye on New York City, the Twin Towers. And now, 19 years later, a different kind of terrorist, a terrorist you can't even see with the naked eye, has put its crosshairs on one of our, the great cities of the world. And tears flooded streets. And we weep because we are all New Yorkers now. And not only there, but across this country, in America's greatest cities, tears punctuate the day in the Big Easy, in the Windy City, in Motown, 
in the city of angels. Tears are found everywhere. It's part of the human story. But friends, here's what I want you to hear. Easter is all about the wiping away of tears. Um, you see what happened is we forgot the purpose of tears. Somewhere along the way, we forgot the meaning of tears. Tears are a God-given reminder of who we are. Tears are a God-given reminder that we are not naked apes, nor are we angels waiting for our wings. We are human beings made in the very image of God. What God? The God who stood by the tomb of his good friend and wept. The God who entered the garden and sobbed. This God is the God we worship. And long before his arrival, Isaiah spoke of the Messiah and said that he would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. This is the God in whose image we are made so friends. Tears are not childish. We think they're childish. No, 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 no. They are childlike. And Jesus says to be childlike is to be in the kingdom of God, the greatest in the kingdom of God. Somewhere along the line, we bought the lie of stoicism. The tears are just emotionalism. No, friends, they are part and parcel of who we are. They are emotions and that Jesus was in touch with all of his emotions and he cried great tears over the brokenness of humanity. We misunderstood tears, friends. It's part of what it means to be human, but that's not all of the story. Listen, Easter. Easter changes the equation because Jesus goes to the tomb of his friend Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come out. Yes, he wept, but he said, come out, and he lived. Um, Jesus went to his friend Peter, who wept bitter tears after his denial, and restored him. And then, and then look, look at this in, in, in John. I want to go back to that story from the first Easter, the first morning. And Mary, we remember we left her at the tomb weeping. And she comes to the tomb, it's empty, but she sees a vision of angels, and the angels ask her a question. Woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken away my Lord, she said. I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you weeping? Jesus always asks great questions. Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. Uh, he was the gardener. Um, what was our first parent's job? He was a gardener. He blew it, didn't he? Ah, oh, there's a different gardener in town. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll, I'll, I'll get him. Jesus said to her one word, her name, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. He wiped away her tears. And then we get to Revelation 5 and remember John is, is weeping there and the angel comes to him and says, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. Friends, Easter is about the wiping away of tears. When we get to the end of the story, which is the beginning of God's great story, we see that in this heaven that has come to earth, this new earth, this redeemed world, that there are things that will not be present in this world. There are things that will no longer be found there. Things like barbed wire and bullets and bombs and bayonets. Things like refugee camps and slums. And viruses won't be there. Revelation gives us its own list 
There's no temple. Why do you need a temple? God is there in person. We can see him with our own eyes. There's no sin. That stuff that separates us from God, from others, from ourselves. No sickness, no mourning, no pain. And what, what, what else? No more tears. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so, in the midst of a heartbreaking season, we can say to heartbroken people, your tears will be wiped away. Your tears will be redeemed. New York City, New Orleans, Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, wherever there is suffering and pain and, lo- and tears today, those tears will be wiped away. That's how the story ends, and it's glorious. Now, friends, without Easter, what do you got? What do you have? Bertrand Russell was a famous British atheist, and he wrote a book that became a bestseller called Why I'm Not a Christian. And towards the end of his life, as he was near death, he was interviewed by a reporter with the BBC. And uh, this reporter asked him, as as you get closer to death, uh, uh, what, what did you have to hang on to with death so close? And Bertrand Russell said this, I have nothing to hang on to but grim, unyielding despair. Without Easter, honestly, that's what you have. Grim, unyielding despair. But with Easter, we have hope. And to quote N.T. Wright, because hope depends on love. And love has become human and has died and, and lives forevermore and holds the keys of death and of hell. It is because of him that we know, not just hope, but we know that God will wipe away all tears from all eyes. And in that knowledge, we find ourselves to be Sunday people in a world full of Fridays. We find ourselves to be Easter people in a world filled with Calvaries. And in that knowledge, we find that the one whose hand has wiped away the tears from our eyes, gives us the cloth and says, now, go wipe away tears from the eyes of those who are hurting, from the eyes of those who have been broken, from the eyes of those who have lost so much because I have the keys of hell and of death. Now you go and you wipe away tears. You go into the darkness and you let my morning light shine into that darkness. You go and you follow me. And together, we'll go about the ministry of wiping away tears. And this is how the great story ends. At the end of the day, tears are no more. And so no wonder they sing this song this new song. Earlier in the service, our team led us in uh, that really wonderful song by Andrew Peterson that I love, Uh, Is He Worthy? Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from shining through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Yes, he is worthy. And he comes to wipe all tears from all eyes. And he says, now you go and do likewise. Friends in a world that is hurting, go and take the ministry of Jesus and the message of Easter, which is the message of hope that depends on love, that died and lives forevermore. Because here's the rest of the story. Easter is the most epic of all stories in which all tears are wiped away. Pray with me. 
Father, how we need this great story to illumine the darkness of our world. How we need the message of Easter today. How we need your good news that though we weep now, one day you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Give us the heart of compassion. Give us your heart, Jesus, to go into a broken world to alleviate suffering, to lift the burdens of those who are carrying so much now, to have the ministry of wiping away tears, knowing that we have hope, and then in the end, you bring your good new world to us. And we thank you, and we worship you, the one who is the risen King. In the name of Jesus, amen.